Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, no one, no one's asked me that question before, oh, but that, that, that's, that's the, interesting. My favorite because... thing to hear as an interviewer. Thank you. Welcome into the NFL on Fox podcast. I am your host, Dave Hellman. Got a fun show for y'all today, a nerdy show with just two weeks to the day until the 2024 NFL draft. Had a chance to chat with a good buddy of mine, one of the foremost draft analysts in the industry. Going to chat with Dane Brugler the day that his draft guide was released for The Athletic. Amazing. We'll, We'll get into it, but... The Beast is available. If you didn't know, get your draft nerd on. We'll be chatting with Dane in a few. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss any of our draft-related content. So make sure you're subscribed on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Like I always say, if you wouldn't mind leaving me a review, preferably a friendly one, wouldn't mind that at all. Go find us on YouTube at NFL on Fox. And you know our social handle handle at NFL on Fox Pod. If you prefer to do this thing on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, you can find us there. We got you covered. So much draft content coming your way later in the show when we talk to Dane, not to mention over the next two weeks. But real quick, it was a little bit of a newsy Wednesday in the NFL. A couple big items for you to know. For starters, I was awakened to the news of another huge contract extension on Wednesday morning. Josh Allen. Not Bill's Josh Allen, the badass Jacksonville defensive end. Edge rusher Josh Allen has signed a five-year, $150 million extension to remain in Jacksonville. He becomes one of the highest-paid defensive ends in the NFL. Well-deserved, 17 and a half sacks last year, set a franchise record for the Jaguars. Good on them for keeping a cornerstone in place. It's just interesting what this means for the future, and in particular, a very high-profile edge rusher by the name of Micah Parsons. With Josh Allen getting his extension, Micah seems to be the next obvious guy in line. He's the only pass rusher who finished top 10 in sacks last year who is not playing on a major extension. He became eligible in January, so starting this offseason, he's eligible to get one. The Cowboys don't have to do it right now, but... Whenever it happens, it's going to be very, very pricey. Josh Allen, $88 million in guarantees and a roughly $30 million per year in salary. So you can bet Mike is going to be gunning to top that deal. He might even gun to top Nick Bosa at the top of the market, 40 and a half sacks over his first three seasons in the league. I don't know when that deal is coming, but Josh Allen getting 150 with $88 million guaranteed just emphasizes Micah Parsons has to be really excited about what the market dictates he's worth. Just something to keep in mind. One other small bit of news the NFL did announce on Wednesday morning. We knew the Eagles were opening the season in Brazil. We knew it was going to be on the first Friday of the season. We did not know the opponent, but we do now. It is the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay and Philly going down to Sao Paulo, Brazil to open the season on Friday night. So if you're keeping score at home, first of all, that's two of the biggest franchises in the league playing on a Friday to open the season. So if I'm, I think I got this right. We got Thursday night, Friday night, a full Sunday of week one, and then we'll have Monday as well. It's going to be a, a just a smorgasbord of NFL football to kick things off. And this new Friday night game, Eagles and Packers, I don't know if you call it the centerpiece or what, but it's an exciting new development. I would love to complain about having my Friday taken up, but who am I kidding? What would I rather be doing than watching two exciting teams kick off their seasons in Brazil? That's going to be a ton of fun. Full schedule release is still probably a month away. The NFL hasn't released the date yet, but it usually happens sometime in May. So we're getting close. Get the international dates out of the way first, I guess, and we'll have the full schedule in about a month. It's starting to feel real. The draft is right around the corner. We'll have the schedule. It's it's it already feels so close. I'm already getting so excited. Okay, so that takes care of the news. Like I said, wonderful, exciting, knowledgeable guest on the show today. My good buddy, Dane Brugler of The Athletic, draft analyst for The Athletic, released his annual draft guide on Wednesday morning. For my money, the best one you can get. 
Had a wonderful conversation with Dane about his draft guide and obviously the 2024 NFL draft. Really fun conversation. Check it out. All right. Really excited to be joined now by an old friend, a good friend, Dane Brugler of The Athletic. And, and we got you the day that you finally released The Beast. For anybody that is not familiar, Dane Brugler's annual draft guide for my money the best resource in NFL draft media. It hit the internet on Wednesday. You can get it with a subscription to The Athletic. Well worth your your time and your money. Dane, for starters, I mean, I guess you don't feel true relief until the draft is over, but I mean, you gotta, you gotta be, you're, you're gonna be sleeping a little bit better after this, this hits the internet, right? Yeah, that's fair to say. Uh, but yeah, this is a year in the making. Um, you know, I, I, at my core, I'm an NFL draft fan. You know, I love scouting. And so I wanted to create a draft guide that was detailed and thorough. And uh, first one was my freshman in my freshman year dorm room, creating that. And it's evolved over the years to become uh, uh, th this monster of a guide. And you know, at some point over the years, it picked up the, the term beast. Uh, I, I can't remember who did it, who first started calling it that. And I even pushed back on that at first. But then I started to embrace it. And it, it's almost like motivation. You know, if you're going to call something the beast, it better live up to it. And, and hopefully with this draft guide, uh, it does. You know, it's the only draft guide out there uh, publicly that has NFL verified testing information for almost 2,000 prospects. Uh, it's just a little bit overkill. But, uh, you know, a lot of these guys won't make an NFL roster. But it, it's good to shine on a light on these guys that have been working so hard uh, so it's you know, over 400 reports, um, a lot, uh, 385,000 words. I mean, it's a lot of info that I think the diehards, the casual fans, there's something in there for everybody. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share that, uh, with everybody today. I'm, I'm not good at selling things and I don't like to do it unless it's something that I like legitimately believe in, which is why I'm going to, I'm going to keep saying this. I mean, it's, it's more than 300 pages. It's. It's just a staggering amount of work. If you want to know about this draft class and Dane even Dane even does you the favor of giving you his projections. So if you want to get an idea of where a guy might be drafted, he's right way more often than he's wrong. And yeah, every damn player in this draft cycle is in this book. Dane, was it was it Jeff Swaim way back when we were covering the draft for the Cowboys who I think is seventh round tight end 10 years ago. Dane doesn't have a report yeah. on the guy. And, uh, and I think you kind of took that as a little bit of a challenge that that was never going to happen to you again. It hasn't happened since. <laughs> and every year when we get started getting the sixth, seventh rounds, I get a little antsy just to, I mean, there's almost 2000 players in here. So it's it, the chances of someone getting drafted. That's not in there are very slim, but you just never know about that one secret meeting about this guy from NAIA school that nobody's heard about. And so you never say never is always a chance, but, uh, I try, I, I do a lot of work to make sure there's no more Jeff Swames uh, in this draft. So, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a little bit something for everybody in, in here. And, uh, I mean, yeah, you and I, we've been doing this. What was our first draft together? 2014, I think it was maybe? 14, was yeah. The Aaron Donald, Odell Zach Beckham, Martin. Zach Martin draft, yep. yeah. That's it. Yeah, we've, so we've been doing this almost 10 years now. That's crazy. It, time flies when you're having fun, man. One, like, one just last on the actual making of the book, because I've, I've known you for a long time, and I've never actually asked you this. Like, I know you dive into the next year's draft over the summer to get ready for college football season, so you've got a handle on these guys. But when do the first words of this book get written? Like, when do you start actually working on the text in The Beast? I mean, it's it's a lot of information gathering, so it's a lot of research, and really, it, it really does start June first. That's when I really dive into the tape, and you start getting the base for what the upcoming class is going to look like. But even like the past few months uh, of this this past draft class, you can't help but pick up extra information for next year. So you're already taking notes. You know, you're watching tape on a player, and all of a sudden, oh, who's that number twelve? Uh, I'm looking up, oh, he's just a, a sophomore. Okay, well, I'm going to start making my notes for him for next year. Or you're talking to a player and he brings up, oh, you better look for this guy next year and this is why. And so I'm always picking up information for next year. But, you know, I, really towards the middle of the season is when I start compiling reports, you know, because obviously during the season, 
you're starting to get updated tape, you're watching that tape, you're taking all these notes, and then you start to build the profile and both the background and the the analysis. And that's why I take a lot of pride in a lot of background stuff. You know, I, a lot of these kids, they, they come from, uh, you know, all these different journeys uh, and no two journeys are the same. And so that's that's my favorite part about doing this is learning about where this, where did he come from? Uh, you know, who helped him along the way? What adverse situations has he overcome? And so try to get all of that into the draft guide because I, I I best sum it up like this. All these, there's all these puzzle pieces everywhere and you have to do your best to collect as many puzzle pieces to create a more clear picture of who these players are and their backgrounds, a big part of that, just understanding where they're coming from. So you can project where they're going. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's a definite uh, time consuming fact finding mission and takes a lot of time, but uh, I think it's, it's all worth it to uh, make sure, you know, fans understand who these players are, but also for these players, I, I want to make sure I'm, uh, you know, projecting them in the most accurate light possible as well. So it's uh, something that, you know, there's, I don't try to make it wordy by any means, but I try to be correct and try to be as clear as possible so we can best understand who these guys are. Take one look at this. I promise you, you will understand what Dane's talking about. It's, it's a staggering every year. It's staggering. All right, let's, let's actually talk about this draft draft class. I don't think there's nobody outside of an actual NFL front office whose opinion I respect more. And I'm curious, just in, a, in an overview sort of way, like from my perspective, doing way less work on the draft than you, you know, you talk about the depth of the quarterback position in this draft class. And we've talked a lot about how great this is for offensive tackles and offensive linemen, as well as as wide receivers. That's what gets the publicity is that right, or or what is your kind of overview of what's worth getting excited about in this draft class? No, I think it's right, and and your point's correct too. Because every year the quarterbacks just suck all the oxygen uh, out of the conversation because that that's what everyone wants to talk about is the quarterbacks. Even two years ago when we had that class with Kenny Pickett and Desmond Ritter and a bunch of guys that are just not going to be NFL starters, it was still the quarterback conversation that was driving a lot of the conversations. Uh, but I, I think with uh, this year, it, it's happening again, but at least it's warranted where we have a guy at the top, Caleb Williams, who is going to be a Chicago Bear, going to be the number one overall pick. And, you know, we can... We, we could talk more about, you know, a lot of people want to talk about the off field and this and that he's going to be the number one pick. And if you're going to bet on any quarterback in this class, it's going to be him. But then it gets interesting. The commanders are going to draft a quarterback at two, but which one is it? Is it Drake May? Is Jaden Daniels? And then JJ McCarthy from Michigan's part of this conversation as well, who doesn't have the body of work that you want, but the tools are outstanding. The intangibles are off the charts. Uh, I know fans hate to uh, talk about quarterback win loss record, but, NFL teams care about that. So I care about it. And with JJ McCarthy, I think it's 36 and two in high school uh, with a state championship, 27 and one with a national championship at Michigan. So he wins where he goes and he has very good uh, conversion numbers on third downs as a passer. Uh, there's a lot of things that with JJ that you really like now, but then you also project him forward and it's easy to get excited about where he's headed. Um, and then even beyond that with Bo Nix from Oregon and Michael Penix from Washington, uh, Spencer Rattler, South Carolina, Michael Pratt from Tulane. I mean, this is a really deep quarterback class. Uh, and then really with the premium positions as a whole, you look at this first round, a lot of receivers off the board, a lot of offensive tackles are going to come off the board. And then a few corners, a few edge rushers sprinkled in there. And this is going to be a first round dominated by those premium positions, which happens a lot. But this year, it really does feel like it's uh, it, it, it's vindicated. They, there should be a reason these guys are going early, uh, which, which is always good to see. And we can extend this past the first round. Cause yeah, I mean, I, I ran the numbers and of course you never know for sure, but yeah, it does seem like a staggering amount of these first round picks. Like if you, if you add up the quarterbacks, the receivers, the offensive linemen, you're, you've probably just accounted for like 24 of 32 first round picks, give or take, yeah. which is, that's a crazy split. Like I went back and looked over the last five or six years. It's usually much more close to 50, 50, but to you and, yeah, and that's then 75%. Right? Yeah. And, and the other, the, let's say the other eight to 10 picks. Yeah. I haven't even mentioned edge rushers and cornerbacks. Like 
it seems like it is going to be very heavy with those, you know, money positions, whether it is edge rush or cornerback or those offensive positions. There's no doubt. And the the other positions that'll sneak in there, you know, you've got a Byron Murphy from Texas, who uh, is a really dynamic defensive tackle. Uh, we've got a really good center class. So Graham Barton from Duke and uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, Oregon. Um, so, you know, the, the other non left tackles and receivers, and even those other guys are, they play a position that, uh, you know, teams really need. So we probably don't see a running, we will not see a running back in their first round this year. Uh, doubtful. We see a linebacker in the first round this year. Doubtful. We see a safety in the first round this year. Uh, we'll see one tight end obviously with Brock Bowers, but you know, he's just a little bit different. He is more of that receiver tight end hybrid. So yeah, this is a, a, a draft where again, yeah, we see these guys go early often, but this year it just feels a little more warranted. Let me ask you this. And I absolutely want you to try to extend this into day two and day three of the draft. You don't have to give me a million names, but you just mentioned a bunch of positions that we might not hear much from in round one. Mm -hmm. What is a position that you find really exciting or really deep that we're not talking about? I'd probably say defensive tackle. Um, you know, it starts with, you know, Byron Murphy, who I just mentioned. Uh, Johnny Newton from Illinois is a really good player. He's right there on the border of being a, a late first rounder, early second rounder. And then on day two, we're going to see probably seven, eight defensive tackles come off the board. Uh, several teams believe Chris Jenkins from Michigan is a top 40 pick. You know, obviously, his dad was a pro bowler in the NFL. Different body types, different types of players, but Chris Jenkins is a really good, really good player. Uh, LSU, uh, down your, your boys down south there in Baton Rouge, they've got a couple defensive tackles in this class with Mason Smith, Makai Wingo. Uh, Smith, he doesn't have the production or the body of work that you know you usually want from a defensive lineman, but NFL teams want 6'5 and 300 pounds, and those types are short supply in this class. And uh, that's why Mason Smith, I think he's going to go somewhere in that second round. Uh, and then Wingo, he's not body beautiful. He's undersized, but just a dang good player. Uh, love his first step quickness, uh, shock in his hands. He's a fun three technique. So, you know, maybe a, a not as explosive version of like an Ed Oliver. That's what you're getting with Makai Wingo. Uh, Michael Hall from Ohio State, similar conversation, undersized. Uh, missed some time the, the past two years with injuries, but for teams looking for that disruptor in the middle, uh, you're going to bet on those traits. And he's one of the youngest players in this draft class. I, I love the idea of Michael Hall. You drop in the Houston on that defensive line with D'Amico Ryans or Atlanta with Raheem Morris. Uh, I mean, I'll be shocked if the, the Falcons don't address defensive line multiple times in the first four rounds. Uh, and then Braden Fisk from Florida State, throw him in there. Brandon Dorless, Oregon. Uh, Devondre Sweat from Texas, a little more of a wild card. Uh, been in the news lately. So, you know, even though this defensive tackle class is missing mess, may, may, that top 10, that high-end first-round guy outside of Byron Murphy, the day two depth, that defensive tackle is awesome. Depth is my one of my favorite words. Like, when we used to talk about this over the years, you talk about a sweet spot in the draft. And I, you know, I, I think it was two years ago, maybe, where the the influx of COVID guys coming out, like you, you would talk to talent evaluators in the NFL, and they're like, Yeah, there's so many more guys coming out. Like the the third, fourth round is where this draft really starts to get exciting. Where do you see that this year in terms of just where the NFL might view kind of the sweet spot of where the, the biggest concentration of talent is. You know, honestly, I, I every year, I, it feels like, wait, the first round is the first round, and then day two is when you really get excited about some of these players. We're going to go hunt for starters. Uh, but this year, it really feels like a top-heavy group. That doesn't mean there's not depth. There absolutely is, especially at certain positions. But this feels like a good year to have multiple first round picks. Um, now, after pick, say, 20, 22, uh, that's where maybe there's a little bit of a drop off. And, you know, that's why we saw uh, the Texans trade back to the second round with uh, the Vikings. The Vikings get that extra first round pick ammo to go get a quarterback. The Texans look at their board and say, OK, we're sitting here in the in the early 20s. I, I think our first round options are going to get wiped out. We feel really good about who we have here in the early 20s as the same guy we're going to get in the early 40s. So I do think that second tier that, you know, between 20 and 50 is still a really good group. 
but this is a really good year to have that first round pick, to have that top 10 pick. Um, after that, I do think, you know, once we get to the top 75, uh, and, and obviously it depends position by position, like edge rusher, we're going to see, uh, you know, four or five edge rushers go in the top 40. And then there's a pretty sizable drop off until really the third round. Um, if you need a running back, it's uh, that's the third round's a sweet spot. We might not have a running back go in the top 50, which is only it's only happened once before in the history of the NFL draft where we did not we only had or we didn't have a running back go in the top 50 picks. So there's a good chance that happens again this year. And then that third round, that's going to be the sweet spot. If you want that running back, if you want your Trey Benson from Florida State or uh, Jonathan Brooks from Texas, uh, there, there's six, seven, eight guys that are going to be in that third round, early fourth round mix. So it really depends on, on the position. But like I said, this is a this is a really good year to have a top 10 pick. And you can't always say that every year. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like it wasn't that long ago that you say, oh, you know, it's fine. And I mean, there's going to be talent in every draft. I think you always have to right. make sure you specify that. But still, this does feel like a year where it is very concentrated in the top 40 or so picks, or like you said, maybe even up to the number 22, which does, it makes it interesting for me. Like I think about a team like the Buffalo Bills, who I think have mm -hmm. six picks between uh, the last three rounds of the draft, like two fourths, two fifths, two sixths. It does make me wonder if teams will be a little more willing to be aggressive this year, if they really do believe that there's a pretty clear gap between the top of the draft and the middle of it. And Brandon Bean, general manager of the Bills, has never been shy about no, trading up no, he and has being not. aggressive. So, yeah, no, that that's... Uh, the Bills are... Uh, one of those teams that you could absolutely see making a move. Uh, you know, obviously we know they wide receiver is a big need for this team. Could they, could we see a Julio Jones type of mo uh, move up to the ninth pick say, and, and get a Roma Dunze? I'd be surprised just because they, this is a team that needs young talent. They need their draft picks, but at the same time, you also need wide receiver talent. And yes, this is a deep wide receiver group. Uh, they could stick and pick uh, in the late twenties and get a lad McConkey or maybe an Adonai Mitchell. But if they have a, if they look at a Brian Thomas say from LSU and say, Hey, that's, He's our new number one. We we think he can be, fill that type of role, really grow into being our featured weapon on the outside. Then maybe you package next year's two and you go up to pick 17 and you get Brian Thomas. Uh, who, I'm really interested with Brian Thomas to see where he goes. There have been teams in the top 10 that have used a 30 visit on him. And there are teams outside the top 20 that have visited with him. So it feels like somewhere in the middle is where he's going to go. But if he went, say, 12, I don't think it'd be that surprising. He is that good of a player where I know we talk about the top three guys, obviously, with Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze, and with good reason. Um, I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr. is one of the best receivers we've seen. Malik Neighbors, if he were in last year's draft or the year before, he would have been my number one overall player in either of the last two drafts. It just happens to be in a class this year wow. with uh, Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr. So he's third for me. But in a lot of other classes, he would have been number one. And then Roma Dunze, I mean, not to give him the short stick at number three, but he is a, a really talented guy who's going to step in from day one and contribute uh, 6'3", 220 has outstanding speed, separates, the route running's awesome, the ball skills, the way he can catch through contact. I mean, it's all there for Adunze. So, yeah, these receivers are fun to talk about. Uh, but, yeah, the Bills are one of those teams. Needs to go get a weapon. And uh, do they have a big move in them to go do it? Let's just, for the sake of talking about as many guys as possible, I guess. I mean, assuming they don't, though. it's And, and that's one thing. I talked to Bucky Brooks about this. And our good friend Bucky, he, I mean, the the top of the receiver position, it looks as good as it has in a while. But I, I'm curious for your opinion at, at how far that stretches. I mean, the Bills, we're just using the Bills as an example here because they obviously need a receiver. At 28 overall, you still feel pretty good about what would be available to you and even into the second round. Like, where where does that depth stretch at that position in particular, given how much we've talked about it? Stretch is pretty far. Um, I, I think we're going to see, if I put the over-under at, um, say, 17 receivers in the top 100 this year, uh, that's a lot. And we're going to see probably 15 or so. And we could see 15 in the first two rounds. Um, so I think it's just, it's a tier system. I don't think there's a big drop-off necessarily. 
uh, between these guys. In my opinion, you have the top three guys in the top tier, and you have Brian Thomas alone in the second tier, and then Lad McConkey, Adonai Mitchell, um, Keon Coleman, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall. Those guys are that next tier. And I mean, on and on, we could, there's so many receivers in this class. And you know, we talk about receivers as the same position when in reality, they're all a little bit different. You know, what Marvin Harrison Jr. offers is a little bit different than Malik Neighbors, what he offers. So, you know, they're they're different and teams will have, you know, especially a guy like like Keon Coleman. Uh, he's very different than Lad McConkey and what he's going to offer. So that's part of this uh, as well. Uh, a team that's looking for a slot receiver compared to a team that's looking for a traditional X receiver. Um, so that's going to factor in how these receivers come off the board, how early. Uh, but even though this is a, I hear a lot from from fans that, oh, it's a deep, deep wide receiver class. So, you know, we don't have to take one in the first round. We can wait. You can, but I do think that a, these receivers are going to go. They're going to go fast. They're going to go quick. We're going to see a lot of them fly off the board in the first two rounds just because that's that's what the NFL, that's what today's game is about. It's about scoring points on the outside, on the perimeter uh, with these big explosive plays. And so if you can get a Ricky Pearsall in the second round, that a lot of teams are going to be signing up for that. So uh, receiver, even though it does stretch, even though it's a really deep group this year, and honestly, I'm convinced receiver is going to be deep for the rest of our lives. That, yeah. that, if you're not a quarterback... That's where that's where the kids want to go play, right? Because they want seven score on seven has and- has made that. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be that way for the foreseeable future. I definitely, I, I think I've said this before, but it's easy to imagine waking up on Friday morning and Dane Brugler has written that there are still eight great receivers available on Friday night, and by the end of Friday, or not even the end of Friday, like fifteen picks into the second round, like half of them are gonna be gone. Like that just seems like the way right. this works. That's I, it. And everyone's going to, everyone has their different orders. Everyone has their different, uh, it's it's interesting talking to teams and how they feel about these guys. You know, and there's teams that like Xavier Worthy, for example, from Texas, perfect example, uh, the fastest man ever at the NFL combine running a four, two, one forty. Some teams are, they, they see that speed and they say, okay, he can maybe be a Deshaun Jackson type for us. Uh, on the outside, other teams look at him and see a more limited player and they view him as more of a third round player. So uh, some of these, uh, it depends on what each offense wants, the type of receiver they want, what they what fits in their offense. Um, and then it, obviously evaluations are different from team to team. So we're definitely, I think your overall point is, is spot on though. These guys are going to go quickly. And so, yeah, you can wait because it does stretch. But I wouldn't wait too long because these these guys are going to go off the board pretty quickly. I always love to ask this question to draft insiders because, I mean, so much of this becomes groupthink. Uh, I mean, especially like when, once you get into like April and and the group thing kind of fluctuates from one end to the other. Like first, we all love a guy. Then we all maybe don't like a guy. I'm curious, how hard is it for you with this incredibly long draft cycle? to stick to your guns, basically. You know, I mean, for instance, uh, here in your in the Beast, you have Drake May as your QB2, your number two quarterback, mm -hmm. which I agree with. But clear, I mean, there's clearly a lot of differing opinions here. I think I read this morning that Jaden Daniels is the betting favorite to go number two overall. How do you stick to your evaluations when there's this much noise coming from this many directions? No, it's, and that's a great point. Um, I, it's impossible to do this in a vacuum. Uh, because it, it, there's just too much information out there, and you don't want to close your off yourself off completely. Um, but at the same time, you have to really. It, it's a process, you know. You understand what you're looking for in a player, um, and you know, like a guy like Jaden Daniels, he just grows on you the more you watch him, and you're like, okay, why? Why am I betting against this guy? The way he can beat you with his arm, with his legs, he just keeps moving up, up, up. But at the end of the day, yeah, you have to, you have to be uh, confident in what you're seeing and what translates to the next level. And I mean, I'll be the first to, you know, I've I've missed on plenty of players over the years, uh, you know, quarterbacks included. Uh, you know, don't go back and read my Zach Wilson evaluation because you know <laughs> it's. Uh, it, but everyone, everyone does. Uh, yeah. there, there's no such thing as a, uh, you know, it's like a a hitter in baseball. If you get on base four times out of ten. 
you're doing a really good job. You're doing your job. And so uh, it's kind of like that when evaluating, especially quarterbacks, you do your best to lay out the facts. This is what he does well. This is what he doesn't do well. And with a lot of these guys, you have to make a projection. And that takes a little bit of a leap of faith. And honestly, there have been times where I've I've thought one way about a player and then he goes on draft day, he goes to a certain team and it's like, oh, never mind. I'm kind of I'm having second thoughts now because either he went to a team that I felt really good about them developing him or the opposite. And so that that's a big part of this equation, you know, doing the the groundwork in terms of evaluating, uh, understanding their traits, what they do well. And then, but the, a big part of this whole thing is the, the the development side and where they go, which team they go to. Do the the team that's developing them understand what to do to get the most out of them? A lot of times they don't, and that that's a big reason why guys bust uh, as much as anything. They go to a spot where they don't get the opportunities, they don't get the coaching, they don't they don't get the right uh, uh, place to. And and that's not to make excuses for why you know you miss on evaluations. That's just. That, that's just reality of how the NFL works. And so, um, but yeah, the, your original uh, question about, you know, sticking to your guns, it's definitely a hard part of that, this doing, doing this year round. And you have to be open-minded while staying closed-minded because you have to be open-minded to updated information and new evidence. But at the same time, you have to block out some of the noise that doesn't matter. And some of the things that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you don't put a, as much stock in uh, as other parts of your evaluation. So. Definitely a, a delicate balance, uh, a tight a tight rope to walk. How much, it seems like, from my perspective anyway, you you have become, I mean, I, you know, I respect the hell out of you. You've always been good at this, but you have become so much more plugged in over the course of a decade. Like, how much more input are you getting from NFL teams and how much is that helping your evaluations as well as you make more and better relationships doing this? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, no one, no one's asked me that question before, oh, but that that that's that's the, interesting. My favorite because, thing to hear as an interviewer. Thank you. Well, and it's it's, but it's the truth. Like, uh, uh, you know, the more and, and I, I have so much respect for scouts. They do so much work. They're they don't get enough attention. Um, you know, a lot of my really good buddies around the league are area scouts, guys that are, you know, doing the, the, the grunt work and, but helping build the board. So general managers and directors, they know where to go on draft weekend. They do all the, all the groundwork. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for what they do and, and getting to know some of them and valuing their opinion. Um, and you know, I, I, you certainly take that and, you know, you don't change your opinion just based off of someone else's opinion, but you try to see what they're seeing um, as if you respect their uh, their eye for talent. You know, you go back and, you know, you kind of check your work. And, and that's what the whole process is for. And that's what the senior bowl is for for me. That's what the combines for for me is a cross checking exercise. If you, know, you see something at the senior bowl that maybe you didn't see on tape. OK, well, I need to go back to the film and say, OK, what did I miss here? Or you're you know, you're having a beer with a scout in Indianapolis and he says, you know, I really like this player. I think he's going to go in, in the second round and you have a fourth round grade on him. Okay, well, I need to go back and figure out, okay, what am I missing with him that this talent evaluator who I really respect w- w- that he obviously sees and likes about him. And a- again, you don't just change your grade. You go back and you do more homework. You try to figure it out. And there have been times where, because again, we all miss on players. He, he, the smartest scout in the world uh, whoever that may be, he misses on players. And so uh, I think that's something I've definitely learned over the years uh, is taking everything with a grain of salt, but having a certain circle that you really trust, uh, a, a certain number of people in there where if they say something, you value that opinion and you do more homework to try and figure out, okay, maybe I meet in the middle here. Maybe I don't see it at all, or maybe the guy's exactly right. And so that's that's definitely part of the process. One last big picture thing I wanted to ask you, and then I've got a couple fun ones for you. And I'm this this could probably be a podcast unto itself, so we don't have to get all into the weeds right now. But I am I'm curious of the idea, and you hear it this year, and you hear it pretty much every year. It seems like where look, I mean, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, JJ McCarthy. It seems as as strong a quarterback class as you could ask for. But I'm always interested in the idea of, well, teams might act differently. Teams might be more aggressive because they don't like next year's class. I mean, it's something, it seems like you hear it every spring. But at the same time, who was talking about Jaden Daniels at this time last year? 
I mean, I'll just stick to the LSU homerism. Who saw Joe Burrow as that guy mm-hmm. at this time the year before he was drafted? So I'm curious what you think about that, about the idea of teams putting so much stock in this year's class when we truly have no idea what we're going to think of next year's class until it gets here. Yeah, and I think uh, those are the two examples, right? The two LSU quarterbacks. <laughs> right. Uh, this time last year, we were talking about Jaden Daniels as what, a third, fourth round pick? Uh, I mean, we were encouraged by what we saw on the 2022 tape, but I don't think anybody saw him going uh, or doing what he did, becoming a Heisman Trophy winner, and then separating himself as a legitimate top 10 player in this draft. I, even the... The, the biggest LSU homers. Uh, I, I didn't mention your name. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> even those well, guys, I don't did think not. you saw this coming, right? Did not. No, I thought he was a good player. I did not think he would go top five in the draft. No. But I, I, it's still important for teams to forward scout. You know, you always look towards next year and especially at the quarterback position, uh, especially for the teams that need a quarterback. You look at it and say, okay, what is next year's quarterback class? What do we got coming down the, the chute? And next year's quarterback class, honestly, right now, doesn't look very uh, exciting. Uh, there's not one quarterback that you can point to and say, oh, definite number one overall pick type of guy that we would be excited about. I mean, a lot of talented guys, but in terms of being legitimate top five quarterbacks, uh, the the feedback I get from teams and just from my own scouting that uh, the little bit I've done towards next year it's uh, not a lot of guys to get excited about. And that's why I think it's going to help for a lot of these quarterbacks this year are going to go pretty early. Uh, how many we see in the first round? Uh, I would I would guess five. I think we're, obviously the four are going to go early. I think one more maybe gets in there. Then we're going to see probably three go on day two and then uh, you know another five, six on day three. So we're going to see a lot of quarterbacks drafted. Uh, and, and part of that, at least part of it, is because teams are looking towards next year. And you, I think you look at a team like the Vikings, they uh, could easily just do a stopgap year and load up on draft picks, wait for next year, get their quarterback. But I think they look at next year's class and say, OK, we're going to be aggressive this year. This is the class where we want to go get our quarterback. Um, and I think a lot of teams are looking at that way. Right? And, and teams like the Broncos. The Raiders, they're picking 12, 13. They're kind of in no man's land. Um, you know, I think that their prime uh landing spots, probably not at 12 or 13, but trade back off or trade back situations or trade up from the second round to go get a Bo Nix, to go get a Michael Penix. Uh, a lot of teams are gonna want to get their quarterback this year just because they're not confident about uh what's coming now next year. And so, but like you said, to, to your original point, it's guys will hopefully surprise us. Uh, take big jumps in, in, in what they do next year. Because obviously what they put on film in 2024 is going to matter way more than anything they do, they have done up to this point. So hopefully we get a few surprises next year. I'm sure somebody will surprise us, but I, I could talk about this all day. I just love the idea that NFL evaluators, NFL GMs have looked at guys who are still in college with the idea of like, do we need to do something aggressive to make sure we get somebody this year? Yes, we probably do. The amount of effort that goes into this is is incredible. All right. Before, well, and now they oh. have to they have to talk to Dion, right? And they have yeah. To get, well, have to, that is uh, yes. Is our, is our team on your list uh, to find out if uh, we can even draft Shadur Sanders next year? I mean, so that that's just another extra part of this now. I'm going to step out on a limb and say uh, Shadur's draft cycle will be a very very interesting one. I think that I don't. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Prediction. I'm not looking forward to it. We'll yeah. I, hey, Dave, one draft at a time, man. One draft at a time. I, know. We'll, I mean, thank you. It's oh, I I can't even wait to see where it goes with Colorado season. In addition to the draft cycle, it's going to be a memorable one. There's no doubt in my mind. All right, Dame. Before I get you out of here, two two quick ones, two fun ones. For starters, I love the back half of the first round because for the most part, we can peg the first half of the first round, like teams Mm -hmm. have 16 to 20 first round grades. And that's, I think it's something for fans to keep in mind. There are, there aren't 32 first round grades in an NFL front office. It's just, it's not how the evaluation process works. So it's a little bit of a free for all. Once you get to the last like 12, 10, 12 picks, Cole strange comes to mind. The new England Patriots guard, there's going to be a name that shocks us. And I'm curious for your best guess at who that might be. 
Yeah, and even it's hard to even do this because there's so many mock drafts out there. We've seen so many I know, names I know. Uh, being mentioned as first rounders. So, but yeah, I mean, in, in your points, right? By the time the draft gets here, I think we'll confidently know 27, 28 names that are going to be first rounders. And it's that last five spots or so that are kind of tough to figure out, okay, who's that going to be? Um, I'll, I'll give you two names that I, I haven't really seen be, talked about as first round type of players, but. If they were to, I think there's at least a chance uh, they could sneak into the first round based off of how teams feel about them. Because teams are going to come out and say, yeah, we feel like, you know, he's a, a top 32 player. But you can tell based just how they talk about him that, OK, it's someone they're serious about. Someone who's got a chance. Uh, first guy is someone I mentioned before with Michigan's Chris Jenkins. Mm. Uh, again, the son of a Pro Bowl nose tackle. Uh, Jenkins, more compact. He's 6'3", uh, 300 pounds. Uh, you know, he's... He's a premier athlete. Um, it, the production won't jump out at you, but then you watch the film and you say, okay, he was asked to two gap. He was asked to control the point of attack. There's a lot more in that body than what the stats might say. And for a lot of teams that need defensive line help, uh, those guys, you know, if you don't get them early, they could be off the board by the time the next time uh, you're, you're picking in terms of the ones that you want. So Chris Jenkins, I think right now is a top 40 pick. If he got into the top 32, I don't think it'd be too shocking. And then the other name, we'll stay on the defensive line. Uh, the Mac, it, it, they're going to have at least one first round pick. We know that. Quinion Mitchell yep, from right. Toledo. I wouldn't be completely floored if they get another one with Marshawn Neeland, the pass rusher out of Western Michigan. Oh. Um, if you haven't watched him yet, watch the Eastern Michigan tape. Burst, bend, heavy hands. Um, a lot of ingredients that teams are looking for at the pass rusher position. So I'm a fan of his, and I know a lot of uh, NFL teams are too. I know you're not supposed to scout the helmet, but Eastern Michigan is where Max Crosby went. Am I? I'm not. I'm not misremembering that. Am I? He did. He did. This okay, is Western so. Michigan, but yeah, no, oh, you're right. Oh, uh, you. Oh no, Max. you said. Oh, well, I'm the worst. You said Western. Yes. No. Damn. No. Sorry. Yeah. Watch the Eastern Michigan tape that Marshawn oh. Lynn or Marshawn Nealon goes up against. That was the tape. That the was like, tape okay, of Marshawn Nealon yes. kicking sorry. Max Crosby's alma mater's ass. Got yes. it. Okay. There you go. There you go. Where else can you get Mac recommendations in round one? Okay, which. You pulled out a Western Michigan guy as a possible first rounder. So now I, I'm dying for your, I need a, I need a pet cat on offense and a pet cat on defense. And it, it can't be a guy that you expect to go in the top 50, just two players you absolutely love who are going to go late day two or on day three. Uh, on defense, we'll go Andrew Phillips, uh, a corner from Kentucky, who I don't know why doesn't get enough love. Uh, probably he's not the biggest guy, 5'10", 3 quarters, 190 pounds, 4'4 uh, four, four athlete. Didn't have a, a ton of ball production. I think that's that's why maybe not a lot of people are high on him, but he's always in position. He stays in phase. He competes. Um, Roger McCreary uh, from uh, Auburn, who was a second rounder a few years ago. I think that's a pretty good comp for him. Um, so Andrew Phillips from Kentucky, I think I'm, I'm much higher on him than I think most people are. And I think he's going to be a really solid pro. Um, and then on offense, let's go, let's we'll go to tight end. Uh, Jared Wiley from TCU, um, I think is going to be a really solid third round pick. Uh, former right. quarterback at Texas makes the transition to tight end. Transfers to TCU, uh, 6'6", 250 pounds, ran a 4'6", 2 at the Combine. Um, you know, he's, I think, just scratching the surface of what he can be. There's only so many uh, true wide tight ends that can be legitimate starters in the NFL. This guy is one of them. So uh, I think it might surprise people how early he goes. Uh, could even be tight end three in this class. That's possible. I think he's going to be up there. So if you were impressed by Dane's scouting reports right there, reminder, download the beast. And he does that for every damn player in this draft class. Dane Brugler, you're a wizard, man. I love talking to you about the draft. I'm so pumped for you that you're done writing the beast for another year. And, and thank you so much for taking the time, man. Anytime, my friend. I enjoyed it. Thanks one more time to my buddy, Dane Brugler. That does it for today's show, but don't worry. We got more content coming your way. Keep your eyes peeled on the channel on Friday for another of our draft prospect previews. Had a chance to sit down with Michigan receiver Roman Wilson and learn about his story and where he sees himself at the next level. Really cool conversation with Roman coming on Friday. So like I always say, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, whether it's on Spotify, whether it's on Apple Podcasts. We'll be on YouTube as well, at NFL on Fox. 
wherever you're getting your NFL content, your draft content. We're right there for you. We appreciate it. Like I said, thanks again to Dane. I will chat with y'all so soon. I appreciate it.